All right, so let's get uh, going on today's class. So um, before we uh, before we get into uh, this intro to um, chapter one, which is kind of like your introduction to learning, just wanted to uh, go through, uh, through a few things. So the MindTab link, uh, your online um, e-text, uh, is now available through Canvas. Um, if you have already signed up, um, if you had already signed up with the link that I made available uh, yesterday as our sort of backup plan in the meantime plan, you might find that you have two different accounts. If so, um, I would highly recommend contact uh, the help at uh, Cengage and uh, just make sure that you're in uh, the right one. Make sure that um, you're not paying for anything because now that the link is uh, in the module in Canvas, you should be able to just go straight through, pay full access uh, to the course. So if there are any issues, um, I do highly recommend contact, uh, just the help button, contact them at uh, Cengage. They're usually very helpful uh, and uh, we'll probably be able to resolve those issues. Should it still say trial in the 15 days? Yeah, that's what I'm, I'm uh, that's what thinking I'm about because about. does anybody else have it where you don't have the trial in? Did you sign up for the trial, the free trial? Okay, yeah, so. I, I didn't either. So you didn't, but you do have. Today, um, make sure that you're going through, um, so you make sure that you maybe clear your clear your history, uh, make sure that you're going through the Canvas link. Okay. Because I'm just worried that it might link you to another account or another class. Right. So I'll double check as as everybody um, signed in and registered. Is anybody not? Okay. So what I would like everybody to do is make sure that you're signed in and you're registered. Uh, make sure that you've accessed, gone into my tab, have your account and everything ready to go. I will go into the course grade book and I'll see who's there. Okay, and then I'll just cross reference that with who's in the class. And if you got double accounts, I'll let you know. And if you don't have an account, I'll let you know. But we'll just we'll make sure we get to the bottom of this uh, as we go forward. But thankfully, it's it's live now. It's good to go. So uh, we will have uh, access to it. And uh, on that uh, note, I just wanted to uh, let everybody know um, for the uh, pre-test, the post-test, and the homework, uh, I want you all to be aware of their settings. So there's different settings so that you know how many attempts you have, how often can you do it, uh, things like that. How are these pre-test, post-test, and homework going to work in, uh, in my tab? So uh, this is for the pre-tests. And remember, again, that the pre-tests, they're labeled in the syllabus, but they're the ones that are called do chapter something quiz. So this is the do chapter one quiz. And these are the settings for all of the, um, the pre-tests. And what I want you to um, uh, be or, or focus on is you do have unlimited takes allowed for the pre-test. So once again, we're trying to get you to the point where you're completely prepared for the course or the class that you were um, doing. Maybe it's your first try and you're ready to go. Maybe it's your third try and you're ready to go. It doesn't matter, just so long as you're ready to go. So you got unlimited uh, attempts, you got unlimited time. Uh, it'll use your best one, so you don't have to worry about lowering your score. By taking it again, it'll use your best score. Um, and uh, it will regenerate algorithmic questions just on the first take for the pretest. So those algorithmic questions, the ones where the structure is the same, but some of the details you know, get changed. Uh, once you start a pretest, that's your pretest. This question will remain the same uh, for the pretest. And then question and attempt before you get hints is only one. Uh, you can check your work on limited times uh, before the feedback is disabled. So it really is set up to allow you just to give it a go and uh, get the class prepared. Uh, for the post-test, remember that the post-test are called copy of do, chapter whatever quiz. And uh, these ones also, you got unlimited takes, you got unlimited time. Uh, however, these ones, you will have um, new algorithmic questions uh, on each take. So if you don't get it right the first time, you can't just, for example, memorize what the correct answer is and then just keep going through, because they are multiple choice. They will regenerate on those algorithmic questions uh, on, every, uh, on every attempt. And this is the one you will also get no hints. 
So on the post test, we've been through it. You've, you've gone through it once. You've done the. You've attended class. For those ones, you won't get any hints uh, even after the first uh, attempt. But everything else is pretty much the same as the uh, pretest. And then finally, for the uh, homework uh, assignments, uh, for the homework assignments, I had to limit the number of attempts for the activity because uh, it's a requirement. So I put it to the max. So you got 10, 10 attempts. Uh, you probably won't need it. Um, and it will, again, take your best uh, for uh, multiple attempts. All right, so those are your settings. This is uploaded in Canvas as a supplemental for the student lecture slides. You'll see in Canvas, you'll see uh, everything is labeled what week and what class it is. So this will be labeled week 01, uh, class two. So W01C2 is what it is. And uh, that's uh, for your pretest, post test, and homework assignments. And I've also um, uploaded last, the last lecture uh, to uh, my YouTube channel. I'm trying to find a better angle for the camera, so don't be surprised if the last lecture you only see like this much of me for most of it. But uh, it's up there on the channel, and you can access the channel through the modules in your Canvas. So there's a module for uh, the uh, Plaid Insane uh, playlist. So you can access it straight through Canvas, and it'll take you right to the playlist. And then you can just choose the course that you want to watch the videos for. So, you know, if you got nothing to do on a Friday night, watch some of my stats courses if you're so inclined. But um, this is the IUSB 2019 Fall Psychology of Learning. All right. So let's get to the uh, to the introduction. So what we're going to look at today is uh, basically the the beginnings, the basics of. Um, in, uh, of learning, the sort of uh, why is it that we do what we do, and also why is it that we uh, rely so heavily on animal experiments. So first we're going to start off with why study behaviorism. If you're familiar with behaviorism, you know that very few people use it anymore. It's been replaced. It's been, um, it's been supplanted by cognitive science. So why are we going to do a lot of our uh, work here? on things that behaviorists have done. And then we're also going to take a look at why are we focusing a lot of our attention on animal experiments? And do they actually have human applications? So we'll give you a brief, uh, very brief history of uh, behaviorism. So we'll start off with uh, John Watson. He is the founder of behaviorism. He is one of the most influential psychologist in the history of the world, uh, one, of the, one of the ones that started psychology here uh, in the States. And he was a founder of behaviorism. He was the one that kind of laid down the found, uh, foundation for, let's not look at the mind, let's look at uh, behavior instead. Uh, following uh, Watson, we get Clark Hull. And Clark Hull uh, formed neo-behaviorism. And uh, he had one of the most influential psychology theories of all time. So his drive theory uh, was one of the biggest theories uh, of all time in psychology. And just to kind of give you an idea of how influential this theory was, when you, uh, if you ever go to psychology journals, you'll notice that there's tons of, uh, there's tons of research being published every single year. And some of that research will be in developmental and they have their theories. Some of that research is in cognitive and they have their theories. Some of the research is in community psychology and they have their theories. Different areas of psychology all have different theories and all their work will be on you know, various ones of these theories. So for any one theory to be tested a lot in psychology is pretty rare because of how diverse our subject matter is. Neil behaviorism as laid out by Clark Hall at one point accounted for or was uh, in 70% of the publications in psychology. So seven out of 10 psychologists were doing work that involved his theory one way or another. So that's like unprecedented uh, in, today's, um, in today's world. It was a massive idea, uh, very, very influential. And then our final little piece of history, we got B.F. Skinner here. So he was considered the most influential psychologist of the 20th century. And usually if people can name one other psychologists, other than Sigmund Freud, Skinner is the next guy that gets named. And we're going to see a lot of his work uh, when we take a look at uh, operational learning. 
So that, those were some of the big names in behaviorism. But as you probably know, uh, behaviorism wasn't, isn't the dominant approach to psychology anymore. People understand that behaviorism is limited, right? It's not enough to understand our minds. So it got supplanted by cognitive psychology. It got supplanted by the idea that our minds are like computers, our behavior is like running software, and that's the new paradigm that we use to understand behavior. So why are we studying in this course mostly work that was done in behaviorism? Why aren't we studying cognitive behavior in order to understand learning? And the reason for that is what behaviorism is, is good at. So if you take a look at a diagram like this, let's say that that blue oval there, that is everything that you want to understand in psychology. That's all the psychology phenomena, right? So that's everything we want to know about behavior, human behavior, animal behavior. We got consciousness in there. We got addictions. Uh, we have um, cognitive dissonance. We have all these sort of things that we want to understand about why is it that we do what we do. And the reason that cognitive psychology is so influential is because the concepts and the ideas and the approaches that it uses can answer a lot of those questions, right? It can't answer all of the questions. One of the ones that is still outside of cognitive psychology is consciousness. If you ever look at research on consciousness, they still don't know why we're aware of things that we do. And if you take a look at how good artificial intelligence is getting at doing a lot of the things that we do, and it is not self-aware, the question really becomes, why are we self-aware? And also the question becomes, how are we self-aware? There's not even concepts to understand who's looking and experiencing what we're doing. So it's difficult to even talk about because it's outside the realm of what we're ready to do. So that's cognitive psychology. That's what behaviorism is good at. So behaviorism got replaced because it couldn't handle all of these things that cognitive psychology can handle, right? So that's why it got replaced as a uh, dominant approach. So why are we studying it? Well, the reason we're studying it is because the psychology of learning is right in here. Most of what we do in the psychology of learning is very, very well explained by behaviorism. So behaviorism failed because it wasn't wide enough in scope but we're going to use it for the psychology of learning because that was one of the things it did very, very, very well. So if you want to understand learning, you camp out in behaviorism, and that's why we're going to be using this, let's face it, no longer dominant approach, but it is amazing at understanding a lot of the psychology of learning. All right, so that's why we're going to be studying behaviorism. So the next question then is, why are we going to be studying animals? So in your readings, you will notice that many of the experiments that led to the theories of learning that we're going to uh, find out about, they were done on rats, pigeons, and dogs. By far the most are done on rats, followed by pigeons, followed by dogs, and then other animals occasionally. But uh, most of the work that was done, most of the groundbreaking work was done with animals. So the question comes that if we've learned a lot of stuff uh, from rats, uh, is that actually relevant to human behavior? Is it relevant to the type of behavior that we're trying to explain in humans? So I didn't have this, this link didn't work last time, so I came prepared today. So we're going to make the argument that yes, it is, in fact, relevant to behavior. Yeah. Okay. All right, it's decided to come back to life. All right, so these are the videos I wanted to show you last time. And uh, let's make sure that everything's recorded. Okay, so this is what I was trying to show you last time. So animal learning, uh, animal experiments, animal studies are what allowed people to develop techniques to allow them to teach and learn um, uh, animals to learn to do things like this. It's on backwards. Friend of 
Ronda Rousey. Oh, 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 all right, so uh, you can watch the rest of that uh, on your own. But very complicated behavior. And it's, it's easy to see that uh, studies on dogs can teach you how to train a dog like that. Studies on dogs can allow us to learn how dogs learn. But we're going to see that those exact same principles can also account for how humans can do some very, very amazing things. So this is the other video I wanted to show you. So this is from America's Got Talent. We have a human doing an incredible human talent. And I don't know why this isn't going through the volume here, but I'll take what I can get at this point. All right, so the same thing that let that dog learn, or allow that dog to learn, the same principle that allow that dog to learn the very complicated agility um, skills that it has, are the, are the same techniques that allow this child to learn to play the violin like this. So it's the same principles, there's some things that are different about human learning, and we're going to talk about those later on in the course, but most of what, of how we learn and how we uh, process and develop skills uh, are the same as how animals do those as well. All right. <laughs> he will not be denied. I'm kind of positive. Okay, I gotta stop it before. <laughs> are you? can't be stopped all right so um, yeah and, and if you if you need a good cry you can you can watch the whole the whole video um, all right so oh it, it gets emotional all right so are they relevant to human behavior so we saw two examples there where we saw extraordinary behavior one in an animal one in a uh, human being and the question is are, are those uh, linked so to break it down to a more sort of um, simple behavior, we can see that they are linked, and I'll give you an example of this and, and uh, things that, uh, how important it is to study the animal models to understand the human behavior. All right, so we're going to start off with Skinner, and we might need to be quiet, I don't know why it's not playing through, but... While some scientists engineer shiny go. new consumer goods for an eager public, Harvard psychologist B.F. Skinner seeks nothing less than the engineering of human nature. In experiments with subjects as simple as pigeons, Skinner declares that with the right social engineering, we can create a new breed of human being. Skinner is firmly in the behaviorist tradition pioneered by John Watson in the 1920s. Like Watson, Skinner contends that with the right tools, we can predict and control behavior. Skinner really inherited uh, the, the mantle from Watson of behaviorism in this country. But it's kind of interesting to think about how there's a subtle difference uh, in the way they went about it. Watson, as we know, ended up becoming an advertising executive, ended up embracing the American value system. Okay, so that's a uh, good... Um, so oh, can, can anybody hear in the back? Okay, so good. All right, we're not total, but a total loss. So that's a very important little aside right there. Watson, the founder of behaviorism, ended up being very, very successful in advertising. And when we get to uh, the section on classical conditioning, uh, it'll be made apparent just how much classical conditioning is used in advertising. So entire commercials, entire campaigns, they are all designed around the ideas of classical conditioning in order to associate good feelings with whatever product is being sold. As it existed, Skinner was different. Skinner was a visionary. Skinner felt that through behaviorism, he could influence the world towards a greater humanity. Not meet humanity where it was, but take humanity to a new place through the principles of behaviorism. Picking up where Watson left off, Skinner wants to do the rigorous science to prove that environment is everything. 
Change the environment, he argues, and you can change the individual. Or in Skinner's case, the pigeon. Skinner himself was a born gadgeteer. Uh, he had, in his own early years, as a boy, for example, he developed ways of sorting ripe, I think it was cranberries, from unripe cranberries. He invented a cannon that would shoot things over his neighbor's fence. This was the kind of man he was. He was developing new ways to do everyday things in ways that were more comfortable, more efficient. During World War II, Skinner had developed a pigeon guidance device for the U.S. military. While the Russians had dogs carrying bombs, and the Swedes had seals to blow up mines, Skinner had a plan of his own. Teaching pigeons to guide missiles to an enemy target. At the time, however, the military had no missiles to guide. But Skinner's pigeon research did not go to waste. All right, they also, the military did not want to invite the PR nightmare that would have occurred if a pigeon guided missile hit the wrong target. So that's why they didn't also go with it, but it was actually more accurate than their guidance systems at the time. And there was a lot of research that was done. You'll, um, pigeons have amazing visual systems. And there was a, a, a study that was done uh, as to whether or not they could uh, form the, uh, the concept of human or not human. So they showed, these researchers showed them pictures and the pigeons were rewarded if they pecked at the picture and there was a human there and uh, they were not rewarded uh, if they pecked and a human wasn't there, right? So they were learned, they were taught to uh, differentiate between pictures with humans and pictures with non-humans and they analyzed it and these pigeons were almost 100% accurate but there was one picture that just about every single pigeon got wrong and every single pigeon was pecking it and there was no human in the, in the picture. So the scientists took that picture and they blew it up and way in the background was this one human that they didn't see just kind of walking you know, along a path in the background and the pigeons saw it and were pecking at it. So their vision was, is, is amazing and there was actually a program where uh, rescue planes and helicopters that would fly out uh, on ocean rescues would actually have a little glass uh, dome uh, underneath them built in with a pigeon inside and that pigeon would peck in the direction that it saw humans in and that was used as a way to increase the search um, uh, the search efficiency of these uh, rescue efforts so all it takes is a little imagination on how to use these you know hopefully at the end of this course you won't be using your skills that you get here for guided missiles you'll be using it for search and rescue but uh, it is amazing what pigeons can do he develops a system called operant conditioning to prove that a behavior will be repeated by a subject when rewarded. Repetition leads to reinforcement. Reinforcement to changes in behavior. This hungry pigeon is moving about more or less at random. Sometimes it turns its head to the left. When it does, we reinforce that movement by giving the pigeon access to a dish of grain. Skinner then waits for it to turn further. Again, more food. Ultimately, the pigeon will turn in a complete circle, having learned that only when he turns will he be rewarded. What Skinner was able to do in very carefully controlled studies with animal models was they demonstrate that whole chains of behaviors could be built step by step so that literally you could teach a pigeon to do complicated behaviors that no one would have predicted possible. All right, I think I found a workaround. Let me just get this in. Let me make sure that we don't blow the speakers. And Skinner believes that if it works for pigeons, in Skinner's mind, behavior is behavior, up and down the evolutionary scale, and it is all learned. So that's like the first iPad, that's like iPad 00, zero back in the day. <laughs> One of the great successes is in education. People 
are taught to do more complicated tasks than anyone had thought possible by breaking down behavior into small steps and giving positive reinforcement along the way. All right, so we'll end this little video here because uh, the point has been made that uh, Skinner learned about how to do certain things with pigeons. And then uh, what happened was that was applied to uh, other endeavors such as uh, education. So it's very, um, uh, it's very interesting to see just how education changed because of the work that Skinner did. And some of the things that we take a look at when we take a look at shaping, when we take a look at uh, operating learning, you'll notice that you've gone through that. So one of the things that allowed the pigeons to learn um, that allowed the uh, dog to learn that agility training, that allowed the violinist to learn his uh, violin playing, is you start off simple and you break things down into little pieces, things that they can already do, and then you build on that to the wonderful, amazing skills that they could never have done uh, on their own. So we're gonna take a look now, now that we've got some volume, uh, at uh, one more behavior that really kind of shows the link between humans and animals and how information on one can um, help us uh, learn about information on the other. So this is your classic, whoops, this is your classic uh, um, rat in a Skinner box. And this rat has been trained to press a lever and retrieve food. And that rat will press that lever over and over and over and over again. And they have done studies on different reinforcements uh, schedules for this rat. Do you give them food every single time? Do you not give them food every single time? They have also done experiments where they have hooked electrodes up to the rat's pleasure center of his brain and that rat will just press that lever over and over and over and over and over again to the point where they had to shut off the sensor because the rat was starving itself. So the rat ignored food to just keep accessing that, uh, that pleasure center. So you can get a rat addicted to actually pressing this lever and that addiction and that ability to do that led people to identify a lot of the causes for human lever pressing addictions, aka gambling addictions. So we're going to see this video right now that shows a lot of what we know about gambling addiction, but again, it breaks down to making an organism press a button or pull a lever over and over and over again, and it uh, really opened up our understanding of that when we found how to do that with rats. It wasn't that long ago that if you wanted to gamble, you had to travel a long way. Well, today, to shoot craps or play slots, all you have to do is get in your car. There's probably a casino in your state or right next door. As we first reported in January, there is now casino gambling in 38 states, which use the revenue from gambling to help solve their bloated budget deficits. The main attraction of these gambling halls is now the new slot machines. There were close to 850,000 of them in the United States, twice the number of ATMs. We Americans spend more money on slots than on movies, baseball, and theme parks combined. But with slots, there is the potential for a dangerous side effect, gambling addiction. And more people are addicted to slot machines than any other form of gambling. The story will continue in a moment. This is what slot machines used to look like, where you pull the handle and hope for three of a kind. This is what they look like today. The mod Okay, so, just real quick. You notice the old-timey slot machines, right? They had the mechanical tumblers that went, went around. 
and one would stop and then another one would stop and then another one would stop. In the new slot machines, everything happens on a computer screen. But you'll also notice that the computer screen displays things so one of them stops and then the other one stops and then the other one stops, regardless of the layout. And we're going to see why that is done. We're going to see that the end goal for that is to keep somebody addicted to playing this game, to doing this behavior, without actually having to pay them out. So this, this technology gave them the ability to go and say, you know, the old design, we don't need that anymore. The old design was kept because it keeps people pressing and pulling those levers without actually having to pay them out. Slots are like high-tech video games that play music and scenes from TV shows. You can play hundreds of lines at once, and instead of pulling a handle, you bet by pushing buttons, which means each bet can be completed in as little as three and a half seconds. It looks like great fun, but it can so be dangerous. No technological addictive. reason why it still needs to be designed that way. It's a learning the reason, it's a mind reason. Is designing machines that can addict people. MIT anthropology professor Natasha Scholl has studied gambling addiction for over 15 years. She's interviewed gamblers, casino owners, and slot machine designers. Do you think that most people would even think that a machine could addict you, that a machine can do the same thing that a drug could? What addiction really has to do is with the, the speed of rewards and uh, these machines if they're packing 1,200 hands uh, per hour into play, you're being exposed, you can see that as being exposed to a higher dose. A higher dose, says Shul, because all that speed means more bets, and that means more excitement. And no machine is better for that than the penny slot, the most popular game on the casino floor. Because the bets are small, you can place hundreds of them at a time. Another core aspect of their addictiveness is their continuous nature. You're not interrupted by anything. You're not waiting for the horses to run. You're not waiting for the guy next to you to choose his card to put down. There's no roulette wheel spinning. It's just you and the machine. It's a continuous flow without interruption. I found that the machines were wonderful. I loved the excitement. I loved the people. I loved the camaraderie, the high fives when you win. It was just very exciting. Sandy Hall lives only a short drive from thousands of slot machines in Rhode Island and Connecticut. Married with two daughters, she worked in a bookstore and used to look at the casinos as an entertaining break. But eventually, she was playing slots so much she burned through her retirement funds. My every thought and every being, if I wasn't at the casino, I was figuring out how I was going to get there. Where was I going to get the money? You know, you're, you sound like a heroin addict. It takes your soul, it takes your humanity. You... All right, so this is a very good example of a theme that we're gonna see over and over again in this course. And that's the idea that really um, bizarre, uh, I, don't want, I don't like to use this word too often, but crazy uh, behavior uh, can be explained by just fundamental learning principles. So if you take a look at this, this woman, the, the one that was addicted to gambling, and if you gave her psychological tests, she's probably going to come out typical, right? She's typical intelligence, typical emotional availability, typical, typical on every sort of scale. What happened to her was she got put into this contingency. And that contingency produced behavior. So we're gonna see example after example where normal, regular functioning people have veered off into these incredibly bizarre behaviors simply because of the environment and the contingencies that they found themselves in. So that's something that's uh, a good thing to keep in mind, especially if you're thinking about going into clinical psychology, because sometimes there's nothing wrong with the individual. It's the environment that they were in, it's the history that they were in, it's the learning that they went through. Come on, you drive home pounding the steering wheel, promising yourself you're never going to go again. You're never going to do it again. And you know that you're going down, and you're going down, and you're going down. I became from a, a nice person. I became a manipulative, deceitful, lying person. Lies just manufactured themselves. You didn't even have to think about it. Marilyn Lancelot, another slot addict, ended up embezzling over a quarter million dollars from her employer in Phoenix, Arizona. My daughters lived within uh, 
two houses away. They did not know I was stealing money or gambling until one day seven police cars drove into my yard and took me away in handcuffs. That's how they handcuffs? Yeah. This is gambling for gambling's sake. Uh, and the aim is not to win a jackpot. It's She's not talking about most people who go to casinos. She's only talking about addicted gamblers. Are you saying that they'd rather stay in the game than win the money? And not only am I saying that, but I found instances where gamblers who won a jackpot uh, then became irritated because it stopped the flow of play. Researchers at the University of Waterloo in Canada measured how players respond physiologically while they gamble and showed that the new machines can make them think they're winning even when they're not. The gambler almost always gets some money back. If he puts in a dollar, he might get back 50 cents. So what she mentioned about um, you think you're winning or your brain thinks you're winning even when you're not, that's actually a feature of the old machines as well. And that's why that bit by bit of a reveal is still kept in because as we're going to see when we go through classical conditioning uh, that allows your brain to say hey I'm winning and then at the end you lose but you already sent that signal that hey I've been winning I've been reinforced for this behavior you lose on that last one they don't pay you out the money and that's why people do a completely irrational behavior so if you just think of it this way if you had a job and you went to that job and after a week you get your paycheck and your paycheck said minus $100, you now owe us $100 for coming to work every day. You would say to yourself, this is ridiculous. That's, no sane person would do that. People in a casino, minus 100, minus 200, minus 1,000, minus 250,000 that they embezzled from their employer. And it's all explained because of these reward systems. But the sounds and flickering lights trick his brain into thinking he came out ahead. The constant feeling of winning creates so much pleasure, says Natasha Scholl, that regular players can slip into a trance-like state, a place she calls the zone. Uh, one gambler told me that when he's in the zone, uh, he couldn't remember his children's name. You go into that trance, that zone, that box. Nobody can touch you. You have escaped from reality. No one can ask you for anything. When you sat in front of those machines, did you get in the zone? Did you have a I was having a love affair with that machine. That was my love. If anybody came near it or touched it, back off. Don't touch my machine. It was the same as a kiss from a lover. Really? It was sweet. All right, so once again, she sounds about as bizarre as you can sound, right? Like, oh, it, the machine was like a lover. It was like a kiss. It was sweet. We're also going to delve into um, how learning affects liking. Right? So when you, when you fall in love, uh, there are processes, psychological processes that are going on uh, that allow you or make you have those positive feelings towards somebody else. So once you kind of understand the principles of everything, this behavior, not that bizarre, right? To actually love the thing that you've had good times with is exactly why you go out on dates, right? It's exactly why you try to plan something fun. It's exactly why people are like, hey, let's go to this really nice restaurant and then I'll take you to a really nice show and we'll have a great time is what people try to do on a date versus, hey, let me take you to this crappy place I know about. You'll get food poisoning and then I'll take you to a boring uh, parking lot and you'll just sit around, right? You don't want to do that because of the same principles that made her fall in love with her machine. So once again, totally bizarre and yet at the same time, totally explainable and understandable once you know the, the principles. Sweet. And yet not everyone is convinced the machines addict people. Listen to Howard Schaefer, the director of the Harvard Medical School Division on Addiction, the man the gambling industry loves to quote. And your position is machines are not addictive, right? That machines, inanimate objects are not addictive? Machines didn't make me do it. If slot machines caused addiction, then most people who play slot machines would develop addiction, and it's the opposite. But at one point, you said slot machines were the crack cocaine of gambling. I did say and, that. And how does that square with what you're telling me today? Not everybody who uses crack cocaine becomes addicted. Yeah, but no. Okay, so I have, I have to weigh in on this one or who you watch anymore. So the rest of this video, we're going to see uh, why it's so important. 
to study these animal models, why it's so important to understand these behaviors, because of the impact that they can have on individuals and the impact that it can have on our society. This professor is a very interesting case because he's saying things that, that just don't seem correct in, in common sense, right? Like uh, crack cocaine is not addictive. So one way to understand what he's, what he's doing is, and you'll learn about this in Methods of Experimental Psychology in your advanced lab, if you want to do science, you need operational definitions. You need definitions that say, this is how you measure this, this is how you measure that. And whatever his operational definition of addiction is, it doesn't fit the current common sense. That's why he can say things like, well, crack cocaine is not addictive, because according to his definition, unless everybody who tries it gets addicted, uh, then it's not addictive. So that's where he's coming from. I remember before he retired, I asked Dr. Hubbard, uh, what is what is defined as addiction, right? Because if you take a look at some of the things that we that we uh, do every single day, things that we get very irritated if we can't do, such as sleep, nobody ever says, "Oh my gosh, I, I got a bad sleep addiction. I got I need eight hours every day, or else I get jittery and I and I can't really function." Nobody considers that an addiction. So I asked him what an addiction was, and it was it was like a twenty minute speech, right? <laughs> it was a twenty minute conversation. It's complicated. This guy is though way on the one side of that definition. Nobody's going to sit here and try to tell me crack cocaine isn't addictive. And if this is like crack cocaine, the conclusion is that it's addictive. So I, I don't come to the same conclusion because How the majority not? of people that have used cocaine have not developed cocaine addiction. Only a small minority have. And the same would be true with gambling. The problem is that that small minority that does get addicted is hit hard. You are getting a little dose of gambling in your brain every three seconds. It's a gambling IV. But and there's a drip, drip, drip. drip. Doctors Robert Breen and Henry Lasur are gambling addiction specialists at Rhode Island Hospital. They've treated 1,300 slot addicts who, when they try to stop, look like heroin addicts in withdrawal. And they're coming in and they could have quit, literally, they have shakes, um, they're, they're really? full of the, sh the cravings, they're physically, are, they're physically having these responses. And you tell yourself, it's got to be, uh, they've got to be on something, yeah. and it turns out that they're withdrawing from the gambling. This right. slots in particular. Yeah. And yet, state after state is turning to slots as an easy way to raise revenue and increase jobs. No state has been more aggressive in luring gaming in the last few years than Pennsylvania, where the opening of the Sugar House in September made Philadelphia the largest U.S. city to house a casino. So far, there are 10 gambling halls in the state with nearly 27,000 slot machines. Former Governor Ed Rendell has championed the casinos. Look, gambling is not anything we should say, oh, thank Lord, we have gambling but it is a decent way to raise revenue where the upsides that's produced is significantly better than any downside that comes from it. You said there were downsides to, to gaming. What are they? The biggest downside is that some people lose their paychecks. But understand, Leslie, they're not losing their paychecks because Pennsylvania instituted gaming. Those people were losing their paychecks in Atlantic City in Delaware at the racetracks so why not or in West Virginia. Virginia. Well, if they can lose it anyway, let's get the upside. We were getting all the downside and none of the upside. The upside, he says, is the $1 billion the state got in gambling revenue last year, which was used to provide a $200 a home property tax reduction, plus more relief for senior citizens. People have been gambling since organized society was formed on the banks of the Tigris and the Euphrates. They were gambling. And they will gamble as long as there is life on this planet. And that's a fact. No one's saying that people can't gamble. This is about government using gambling to prey on human beings for profit. Les Bernal is head of the national organization Stop Predatory Gambling. He and former Massachusetts State Senator Sue Tucker have been fighting a move to bring casinos and slot parlors to the Bay State. We're in the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression. And the, the daily voice of government to most Americans is, we're gonna, we're gonna push casinos, or we're gonna push lottery tickets. Well, but you have a situation where states are desperate. They're way over budget. They have to find revenue somewhere. They know people will gamble. As a revenue raiser, it defies every principle. It's regressive, 
In other words, it takes far more money out of lower income people's pockets than higher income. It is cannibalistic. In other words, it eats other forms of revenue. When you have your citizens dumping two billion down the slots, they're not buying a new car, and you lose that tax. You brought these casinos to the state. Do you ever just say to yourself, oh my God, I'm, there are a lot of people who are suffering, and they're taking whatever money they you have, don't listen. and they're you throwing don't listen. it away in these casinos. And do you ever just listen. say, oh, what have I done? You don't listen. Anyone who has that bent would be doing it in other places had Pennsylvania not legalized gambling. The counter argument is that you're creating new gamblers. But then lots of them are creating new gamblers. Well, because it's down the street. By, by, I mean, just a lot of Those people play the lottery. They bet they on football. They wouldn't necessarily. How much money is bet on the Super Bowl? People are losing money for the state to get its revenue. They're uh, losing listen, money. Let me ask you this. You have I've always been on you for two or three decades. You're a very smart person. But not now. But you're not getting it. Oh, no. You're not getting it. Those people would lose that money anyway. Don't you understand? Our pressing him on this point led to this. You guys don't get that. I do get it. You're simpletons. You're idiots if you don't get that. We couldn't figure out why all the emotion. But his main point was that gambling is good entertainment, and people should be allowed to make their own decisions about it. But since the first casino opened in Pennsylvania five years ago, calls to gambling addiction hotlines in the state have tripled. Sandy Hall says her problems didn't start till three casinos opened near her. I cannot read my local newspaper without having full page ads of upcoming events and slot play and free this and free that. Um, the exposure is phenomenal because of the proximity of three casinos. Fewer than 25% of Massachusetts residents went out of state to gamble. That's a lot of people. 75% didn't. I know, but that's the group the industry wants. They want the 75% that can get on the tee and go to a nearby casino and get in trouble with gambling. That's the playbook. All right, so that was gambling addiction. And again, much of what we know about designing slot machines came from studies on rats and what will make them press that bar over and over and over again. What will make them press that bar for less food over and over and over again. And then also on the flip side of that, uh, treatment for gambling uh, is based on a lot of research that took a look at rats and said, what well, will stop them from pressing that bar over and over and over again. So we're gonna see a lot of, again, and I'll do this, I'll tie together parallels from what we learn about animals and uh, human behavior throughout this course. So any, uh, any comments or questions on that before we go on to our next example? All right, yep. So they're saying that some people are just more susceptible to forms of addiction and different forms of addiction, basically. Like the, they are more likely to experience that pleasure from those simple tasks of pushing the button. I think, uh, I mean, there is individual differences across, you know, uh, across people. I know um, uh, they, they learn at different rates, but one thing that we'll find is that these principles, they work on just about every single individual. They're almost universal uh, learning principles. So the things that they mention about, you know, um, uh, the immediacy, right? We learn better, our behavior changes more when we get immediate feedback. Uh, the things that they learned, uh, they said about proximity. Uh, most things we learn better when they're, uh, they're very proximal. That's why slot machines are so addictive because when you win, the money's right there, right? It just pops up and you're like, oh my gosh, here's, here's my money. You don't have to uh, go anywhere to get your money. You don't have to stop, right, um, to, uh, to extend that time. And that's why other things are not as addictive. If you've ever played uh, poker, at a casino. You know sometimes it takes a while, you're sitting on your hand and, and you're like, can we you know, make a decision? <laughs> can we get this turn and finish? Um, so it doesn't have quite that effect. Now, one of the things though is that it's not going to hit everybody the same, but that also gives us clues as to who can get addicted and how they get addicted. So the one thing that, uh, that we'll see is that addiction oftentimes takes this form of what is known as shaping. And shaping is when you start off with things that are pretty simple, 
and then you get to more complicated, complicated, complicated things. So when you're learning to play the piano, uh, your teacher will take you through shaping, and they'll first start with, you know, this is where your hands go, right? This is something that you can do, and then little bit by little bit, this is how you play a scale, let's do that a little bit, until you're playing like Beethoven's Fifth Symphony and you've got this huge complex um, pattern of events. The casinos know that as well. They need to shape this behavior. So the first thing they need to do is they need to get you there, right? The first behavior that they need to shape is a very simple uh, task of getting you to a casino. That's why proximities of casinos are very important because it's a lot easier to get somebody when, uh, there when it's down the street rather than when it's 100 miles away. So that's why they have those uh, you know, free slot tournaments, right? That's why they have those, you know, bring this in for a hundred dollar free credit. That's why casinos have shows, right? If you ever wonder why casinos have concerts and they have magicians, it's because they're shaping people to get inside into the, uh, into the casino. And that's why they give you the free, uh, you know, uh, the free startup, right? Here's $20 uh, free in chips so that you can go and you can actually practice the, this is, this is the motion of betting, this is this. And one thing that they have found, though, is that oftentimes somebody who gets addicted to gambling will have a big win early on. So the people that get addicted to gambling are the ones who are like, well, you know, I, I've never tried slots, let me try this one. They put it in, they pull that handle, it's like, oh my gosh, a jackpot. That high reward right at the beginning makes them much more susceptible to developing that addictive behavior. And uh, it's, it's one of those things where it's important to understand that these are basic uh, processes and uh, you can either use them to you know kind of get people addicted or you can use them to get addicted to good behaviors right so if you um, you know most parents try to do is you try to reward the good behaviors so that your children will get rewarded for that feel rewarded so that they'll want to do it more and more and more uh, just like somebody who's addicted to gambling wants to do it more and more and more but um, the essence of your question like who gets addicted and who doesn't get addicted um, that is, uh, just kind of tie this up, that's like the Nobel Prize winning psychology question that's out there. So as a psychologist, you can predict groups of people. So if you, if you gave me two groups of people and you said, all right, this group of people, they had a traumatic experience. This group of people, they did not have a traumatic experience. I can tell you without a doubt, there's going to be more people suffering from PTSD in this group than there is in this group, right? And I, I guarantee that's what our theories you know, have shown. If then you ask me, okay, well out of the 100 that are gonna get PTSD, which one? Then I, I have no idea. So if you can predict the individual rather than the aggregate groups, then invite me to your Nobel Prize party <laughs> because that is, that's literally like the holy grail of, uh, of what psychologists are trying to get to. Any other questions, comments about this? All right, so the last thing we're gonna take a look at today is we're gonna take, another, take a look at another example where studies on animals really open the doors to understanding a uh, important human behavior. And we're gonna talk about uh, Martin Seligman. So Martin Seligman, he wanted to study um, the effects of prior learning on subsequent learning. So if you learn something first, will that affect how you learn other stuff uh, later on? So he set up this very influential experiment where he uh, had two parts to it, and uh, he used dogs for his experiment, and he split them up into three groups. So every dog was run individually, but dogs in uh, group A, they would be placed in a room, and for a predetermined period of time, let's say it was a 10 minute session, they would be placed in that room, and they would just wander the room for 10 minutes and they wouldn't get shocked. All right, so importantly, group A in part one received no shock. Group B, on the other hand, when they were placed in the room, when these dogs were placed in the room, they would receive a shock. So the floor would start to be uh, shocked, but there was a panel on the side of the, uh, on the side of one of the walls where if they pressed that panel with their nose, the shock would turn off. So they had escapable shock. They were able to escape the shock once it occurred. And then group C had inescapable shock. And the, group, the dogs in this group, they were in another room. And when group B was shocked, they were shocked as well. 
And when group B turned off their shock, their shock turned off as well. So that's a very important thing to remember, was that the dogs in group C were shocked exactly the same amount as the dogs in group B. The only difference was that the dogs in group B, their actions turned off the shock. The dogs in group B, their actions did nothing. Right? They could press the panel, panel did nothing. They couldn't turn off their shock on their own. But they were not more shocked than group B was. So what eventually happened? was that uh, the dogs in the no-shock condition, they just you know, sat in that room wondering what's going on. Uh, the dogs in the escapable shock condition, they learned that pressing that panel would turn off their shock. So they eventually learned that, oh, when the floor starts to be, you know, uh, starts to feel painful, I'm gonna go over here, I'm gonna press this panel, and the shock will turn off. So they learned that behavior. And the inescapable shock group, uh, they didn't learn that because there was nothing to learn. Their panel did nothing. So they were probably just wondering, what's, you know, why am I still getting shocked? So that was part one, all right? So no shock, escapable shock, inescapable shock, and importantly, exact same amount of shock between those two groups. All right, part two. In part two, every dog got the same treatment for part two. And what they were done, uh, what happened was they were placed in a room uh, that looks like this, it's called a shuttle box, and uh, they would have two halves of the room separated by a hurdle. And there would be a tone that would play, and after the tone played, the floor would start to be shocked on one side of the room. And the dog could escape that shock by jumping over to the other side. And then while it was on the other side, there would be no shock, then a speaker would play a tone, uh, after a few moments, the floor would start to get shocked and it could escape once again by jumping over to the other side. So it could learn to escape the shock by jumping once the shock began. And then eventually it could learn to completely avoid the shock by hearing the tone and then saying, uh oh, I'm gonna jump over to the other side and it wouldn't be shocked at all. So the question is, is what happened to our three groups? What happened to the dogs uh, who had prior learning that was different when they were all given this task to learn. So we have our three groups now in the same task. Did they learn to jump over to the other side? Well, group A, who previously did not experience any shocks, they did learn to jump over to the other side. So they learned the hurdle response. They learned to avoid the shock. Uh, they had successful learning uh, in part two. Group B also learned to avoid uh, the shock. And I don't know the, the particulars of their trajectory. I would assume that at the beginning of this stage, they were looking for the panel, going, where is that panel that worked so well in the past? But even with that prior learning, they were able to learn to jump to the other side to avoid the shock. The big result, the reason why this experiment was so influential and so famous, was what happened to Group C. Group C did not learn to escape the shock. So even though they were completely able to, even though it was completely possible for them now to escape the shock. Group C could not learn that jumping response and basically uh, just kind of lied down and took it, whimpered, just put up with the shock until it was over and uh, never learned that response. So they had the possibility, but it was their previous learning that prevented their new learning of this behavior. Any questions on that so far? All right. so. Seligman took a look at this, and uh, this is what helped develop the idea of learned helplessness. So these dogs, these dogs in inescapable shock condition, they had all the power to escape their shock, but they didn't, and that led to the uh, idea of learned helplessness. That learned helplessness helped us understand massively uh, what is going on in people with uh, depression, how depression develops. So those dogs in group C had depression-like symptoms uh, you know, in their behavior. And uh, it basically allowed uh, Seligman to come up with a theory of uh, why is it that some people develop depression? Uh, is it because they were ineffective in their previous uh, learning history? So this is an example. Uh, this is the reason why uh, people are so focused on bullying these days. Because when you think of bullying in a school, what that is, it's, it's, it's an inescapable shock. 
especially if you went to school in the old days where a person's response to a child when the child says, oh, I'm being bullied, was basically, well, stick up for yourself, not go off and play, I'm busy smoking cigarettes in the back of the school. Or whatever. Um, that used to be the response. The response used to be, you're not tough enough, go toughen up, right? It's just a, a rite of passage or whatever. They have found that people that were bullied in, uh, in elementary school and in, in high school uh, develop these bad, uh, learned helplessness, uh, depression-like symptoms. So we see this all the time, uh, maybe in ourselves, maybe in our friends, when somebody is stuck in an uh, abusive relationship. And you ask them, you're like, you on the outside, you're looking in and you're saying, look, just leave the person. Like, just go. They're bad for you. Just What you're saying is just jump to the other half of the room. And they, they're like, no, I, I just... I, I, I don't know what it is. I just, you know, I'll be alone forever. I just can't do it. You know, I'm just, I'm just going to stay with them. I'm going to stay on this side of the room and I'm going to get shocked. You know, people in horrible jobs with horrible bosses, right? You might look at them and say, look, you're, this job is killing you. You have skills. Leave. Just go. Quit. Find another job. Jump. Jump to the other half of the room and, and they'll be like, I don't, I just can't. I can't take that chance. I can't lose this thing. I'll just put up with it. This is what it's going to be. That's just how it's going to go. So it really helped understand some of the causes of depression and uh, identify uh, those behaviors that actually lead to depression, such as, you know, being bullied. And uh, furthermore than that, uh, he used this also to develop positive psychology. So positive psychology, I remember when I first heard about it, I jumped to the conclusion that positive psychology is probably some sort of like, ooh, we're going to be happy all the time and just focus on positives and let's all be uh, good to each other. Um, does anybody know what positive psychology is? Did anybody think it was like that? It was like a kind of hippie love fest uh, type approach or anything like that? Okay, that's what I thought when I first heard about it. Positive psychology is actually the idea of taking somebody and using psychology to make them uh, super at, at different skills. So most of psychology before Seligman was what could be termed as negative psychology. So you have people functioning at a normal level, and if they dip below that level, that's what psychology is, is gonna be used for. It's gonna be used to take a look at people who are not functioning at a normal level, and let's bring them back up to normal. What Seligman noticed is he noticed that some dogs in group C, they didn't give up. Right? Some dogs, few, very few, some dogs did learn to jump over to the other side. So he started studying, well, what are some of their traits? What are some of their ideas? And how can we take that knowledge and take a look at people who are functioning normal and make them super functioning? It's kind of like another, a nice analogy is positive psychology is like the bodybuilding of psychology. Right? You're looking to build your muscles and build your skills, your mental muscles, your mental skills, far in advance of what is currently able. So if you see somebody who competes at the Memory Olympics, they've developed their mnemonic techniques, they're part of positive psychology. If you see somebody who's super resilient, you know, the kind of person where they tried to start a business 25 times and, got, and uh, lost everything 25 times, and you say, well, what are you going to do now? And they're like, well, I'm going to try it 26 times. They're on the other side of positive psychology. So I mentioned this, and I love this example, and I wish those dogs, after they were uh, done with this experiment, got nothing but steak dinners for the rest of their lives, because the book that he wrote, uh, Learned Optimism, How to Change Your Life, that was actually uh, what my cognitive behavioral therapy was based on when I got treated for depression. So because of the pattern of my depression and the, well, I'll be honest with you, the bullying that I had uh, gone through when I was a kid, uh, that's where my depression came from. So I had to learn a lot of this uh, optimism. And uh, one of the uh, kind of uh, reprogramming things that occurred in my mind was what they call the, the three Ps, uh, where we, people who have learned helplessness, process things as being permanent, as being uh, pervasive, and as being personal. So I'll mention this in case any of you might think the same way. Uh, it, it, it's a sign of you might be at risk for developing depression. So everybody in the world goes through tough times, right? None of, 
if, if your life has been perfect up until this point, congratulations. I'm happy for you. But most of us have bad days. Most of us have hard, hard times. And what makes us either develop a mental illness or not develop a mental illness is basically how do we cope with those particular uh, setbacks. So if you have learned helplessness and you're on your way to developing depression or you're already in that depressive state, the three ways that you take setbacks is the first thing that you do is you take it personal. So the easiest example for this and one that might be relevant is let's say you do poorly on an exam. Right? Let's say you do an exam and you get it bad and you're like, oh my gosh, I failed my exam. If you have learned helplessness, if you've been in that inescapable shock, first thing you're going to do is you're going to take it personally. You're not going to say, well, this exam was too hard. I'm totally fine. You're not going to say things like, well, the teacher just didn't do a good job. You know, that's why I didn't do well on the exam. You're going to take it personally. You're going to say, oh man, I'm stupid. Like, I just can't, I can't do this. I'm not smart enough. Right? So you take that feedback and you take it personal. That's number one. Number two is it's permanent. You, you take it as permanent. So if you take it not permanent, you're gonna take a look at that exam and you're gonna say, oh man, I got an F on this exam. I'm gonna get an A on the next one. All right, so no big deal, I'll get an A on the next one. This isn't permanent. Somebody from, with learned helplessness will take a look at that exam and say, oh my gosh, I got an F on this exam. I'm gonna get an F on the next exam, and then the exam after that. This is just my permanent state. That's how I'm gonna do. And then the last thing is, is that it's pervasive. So whereas a person who is, uh, has um, a typical reaction or a non-pervasive reaction will say, oh my gosh, I got an F in, uh, you know, in my math class, I'm, I'm going to rock my history class. Right? I'm going to rock my history class, I'm going to do awesome in Spanish. This is not pervasive. Somebody with learned helplessness will say, oh my gosh, I got an F in my math class. I'm going to get an F in Spanish, I'm going to get an F in history, I'm going to flunk out of college, I'm going to get a bad job, I'm going to end up in a horrible marriage. If anybody would marry me at all, I'm probably going to die alone. It's everything, right? It's not just a little, little compartment of your life that's wrong. It spreads to everything. So all of these sort of things were what needed to be reprogrammed uh, in my mind when I went through that cognitive behavioral therapy. And literally all of it came from an experiment on three groups of dogs. So when you are reading your studies and you're reading about the, the rats and the pigeons and the dogs, always keep in mind that link. It'll help keep you motivated, it'll help keep you on task and focused that you know, while we're learning about all these animal models of learning, it does mirror what humans go through, how humans learn, and importantly, what you can do for humans uh, based on these learning principles. All right, so that's all that I wanted to cover today. Any questions before we wrap this up? Yep? Can you say that a little bit louder? Sorry. So you think that the two things that people experience when they have no consciousness mm -hmm. is taking it personally and being appropriate. Yep. Well, there, there's, uh, there's actually the three things. So personal, uh, pervasive, and permanent. And uh, just like with any other um, uh, answer to behavior and psychology, it is possible to have more of one and less of the other. But that's the typical pattern that you'll see in people's thought patterns when they go through or when they're in uh, learned helplessness. So um, I'm sure that just because humans are very, very different uh, individuals, some people might take it more personally and less permanent than other people. Other people might take it less personally and more permanent. But um, typically those three things go together and they're in an elevated level compared to typical functioning individuals. Any other questions? All right, so that's it for today. So uh, again, if you haven't already, make sure that you're registered for class. Go through the, uh, the Cengage uh, link in Canvas. This Friday, I'm going to take a look at everybody that's enrolled and I will let you know, number one, if I don't see your name or if I see your name twice, so if you're double registered. So if you don't hear from me, that's good. If you do hear from me, it's going to be for one of those reasons. And I will see you all next time.